Um, okay, uh, hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Dani Mulugeta. I'm a lecturer of African politics at the Department of Politics and International Studies at SOAS. I also lead a UKRI funded future led Darius Fellowship scheme um, uh, called Pan African Frontiers and Identities, the remaking of Africa in world politics based at SOAS. Uh, we study the intellectual and the policy implications of the mobilization of the idea of Pan-Africanism in the fields of African security, African development, and diaspora politics. Uh, our project seeks to preserve the legacy of Pan-Africanism, also at the same time uh, revive the idea in a new way as a prism to understand African continental and uh, diaspora politics. As part of this program, we aim to launch a new center for Pan-African studies as SOAS by the end of the year. The center will serve as a sort of a platform for research, policy dialogue, and public engagement on uh, Pan-African issues. So stay tuned uh, for updates on this area. Now turning to today's event, we are delighted to host this panel discussion in honor of the 16th anniversary of the foundation of the Organization of African Unity, now the African Union. The OAU was established on May 25th, 1963 in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, with the aim of ending colonial rule, promoting unity and solidarity among African countries and the diaspora, and fostering economic, social, and cultural development of Africa. We have come a long way since the years of independence. African Union has carried uh, forward the Pan-African mission of unity, making progress in many areas over the past two decades, but uh, with mixed results. As we celebrate this uh, historic milestone, our panelists today will reflect on the legacy of Pan-Africanism, the evolution of decolonization in the past six decades and its current trends, and share their views uh, and opinions on the AU and Africa's future. With that, I would like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Leo Balcha Gabriel-Mariam, who is a research associate at the University of Bristol, uh, who is going to be introducing our distinguished speakers and moderating today's event. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Danny. And uh, hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, we are really happy to see lots of people attending this uh, live webinar. So uh, today we will be reflecting on the 60 years of African unity, or the establishment of the Organization of African Unity, by reflecting on the legacies of Pan-Africanism. As Danny said, my name is Yobal Chagabramariam, an Ethiopian citizen uh, working at the University of Bristol in the UK, so I'll be moderating this session. Before we start, I would like to read the following housekeeping rules. One, please note that this session is recorded and the recording will be made available on the Pan-African Frontiers website at the School of Oriental Studies, Oriental and African Studies. Second, please use the Q&A section in the webinar to raise your questions. If possible, by mentioning the name of the speaker that you want to respond uh, to the question. We have technical assistance uh, collecting from people uh, with us, Abdul Wando, Mikhail Waldo, and Sunil Pil, who, Sunil Pan, who would uh, collate the questions. And that's, uh, that will be handled uh, at the webinar. So uh, the lineup will be, uh, Professor Tim will go first, then followed by Foluke, and our third speaker, Achen, I hope she will join us whenever she can, and followed by Yirgagala. Uh, before we start, I just want this to also to be more interactive. So I, I would like to raise this question for everyone who joined us online. So I assume that you joined this webinar because you show you have some interest on the issue. So I have one particular question, uh, if you can allow me. Uh, I think Pan-Africanism is a very broad idea, and I want everyone to use their uh, any device, any multiple, uh, any electronic device that you have 
to go to menti.com. I, I hope some of you have already done this. You go to menti.com and enter this code, 78456909, and answer these questions. What comes to your mind when you hear the word Pan-Africanism? We just want to know what are the diverse ideas, concepts, concerns, aspirations, or things that come to your mind when you hear the word Pan-Africanism. Our speakers will deal with it from different points of views and perspectives, but I think it's also fair to give uh, an, a room for the participants to share ideas. So go to menti.com, enter this code. You will have at least three options to enter your word or your ideas. Excellent. Can you see it on the screen? It's worth building. Okay. Africa, history, communal struggle, inclusiveness, diaspora, togetherness, strengths, liberation, unity, future. Okay. Utopia. Yeah. I hope <laughs> African consciousness. Okay. Desirable. Problematic, common purpose. Please uh, continue to enter your words your, as we go forward. So, and uh, I will share it later. You still have, I, I will, can, Abdul, can you put the code in the chat, 78456909, so that people who join us later can also have access to it. Okay. I'll stop sharing here and we'll have a look at it later. And I will also ask the same question again at the end of the, the webinar so that we see if there's any change in the dominant terminologies. So let me introduce our first uh, speaker. Our first speaker is Professor Tim Ruti, who is head of the Peace Building Interventions Program at the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation in Cape Town an extraordinary professor of African studies at the Center of African and Gender Studies, University of the Free State in South Africa. So the question that I would like team to respond to is, can you please provide us with a brief historical background on the Pan-African movement, its institutionalization over the past six decades, and reflect on the extent to which Pan-African ideals shape Africa's role in international affairs and global politics. Tim, you have seven minutes. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Io, for the introduction and also for the invitation to be on this panel. Yes, I'm glad that somebody put the idea of African consciousness on the, uh, the Mentimeter, because I think that's a very important prism for us to look through. Um, I think it's it is a necessary uh, you know program of activating our pan African consciousness going forward as we try to advance the pursuit of African unity and solidarity. Um, and even getting to the point where we are developing a, a pan African school of thought uh, in terms of how we uh, organize our thinking. Well, I think um, I think the people on this uh, platform will be familiar with the African Union. Uh, they might be less familiar with the its predecessor, the Organization of uh, African Unity. But I would say both represent the institutional incarnations of the spirit of of Pan Africanism. Um, and while we we do have these institutions, I would say that. Uh, we still face some tremendous challenges in activating and forging Pan-African consciousness and identity, and also consolidating a sense of Pan-Africanism among citizen across, citizens across the continent, but also uh, across the, 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 the diaspora, um, uh, and where we have, as you know, uh, quite an extensive uh, uh, group of people from African descent who live um, across the world. Um, if I just go take a historical, you know, uh, 
perspective briefly to say that um, you know the Pan African movement uh, dates quite far back in time. I think we can go even to the 18th century, uh, perhaps even beyond that, uh, just to to see the initial writings uh, around the idea of of Pan Africanism and to reflect on some of the objectives uh, that Pan Africanism had. I would say there is no single definition of Pan Africanism. But in fact, we can say there are as many ideas of Pan-Africanism as we have thinkers. Uh, and so rather than being a unified school of thought, I would say more it's a movement uh, which is uh, linked to our common struggle for social, political equality and freedom from economic exploitation and racial discrimination. And it's good to see also some of those ideas emerging uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the Mentimeter. So Hakim Adi and Marika Sherwood in their very, very uh, fascinating book, Pan-African History, Political Figures from Africa and the Diaspora since 1787, um, actually did make this very important point that Pan-Africanism has taken on different forms at different historical and geographical locations, but there is a unifying uh, underlying ethos, which is a belief in a form of unity, common purpose, amongst peoples of Africa and peoples of uh, Africa, Africans in the diaspora and, and, and a celebration of Africanness. So I think we do have to accept that Pan-Africanism is an invented per notion, it's an invented idea, but it is an invented idea with a purpose. I think Pan-Africanism is a recognition of the fragmented nature and existence of Africans, um, our marginalization, alienation, on our own continent, but also in the diaspora. And it seeks to actually respond to the sense of alienation uh, uh, under development um, and prevent the, uh, the culture of dependency and external assistance, which unfortunately still prevails on the continent. And I think this is something for us to actually focus on the importance of Pan-Africanism, speaking to our own agency as Africans and speaking to our own strengths and capacities to become self Reliance. So Pan-Africanism is a recognition that we are still divided. And that's why we are undertaking this project of Pan-Africanism. Uh, even within our own continents, our own mindsets are still divided. We're still uh, decolonizing the way we look at ourselves, the way we look at the world. Um, and I think that is where we need to, to kind of head to. But in terms of the institutionalization of Pan-Africanism, if I can just very briefly go back to that point, uh, there was a series of uh, Pan-African Congress meetings um, in the early uh, 19th century, which, be, which then led into the 20th century. Um, the, interesting enough, the initial meetings were held in the USA and the United Kingdom. Uh, Af African-American uh, thinkers and academics, W.E. Du Bois, Sylvester Williams, Henry Sylvester Williams uh, from Trinidad to Jamaican, Marcus Garvey, uh, before Africans like Kwame Nkrumah, first president of Ghana, Secretary of Guinea, Leput Zengo of Senegal, Ben Nasser of Egypt, Ben Bella of Algeria, they eventually took the mantle. And by the 25th of May, 1963, the Organization of African Unity was established. And that's why we actually celebrate uh, 25th of May as Africa Liberation Day, a sense of celebrating the spirit of Pan-Africanism. Um, the onset of uh, the scramble for Africa we can touch on is something that emerged. African Union faced a number of challenges. And I think um, 20, uh, April 1994 was a significant uh, point in time in the history of the, of the organization when we had the genocide in Rwanda. And it really led to some deep reflection that the OEU mechanism for conflict prevention and resolution had failed uh, to prevent not only the, the genocide in Rwanda, but other conflicts, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Democratic Republic of Congo, Sudan. Sudan, we're still dealing with this even up to now. And uh, so it's not only, uh, you can not only call out the AU, but OAU, but also the UN. But the OAU made a decision. The leaders of the OAU decided to then push the institutionalization further to the African Union in July 2002 in Durban, South Africa. The African Union is born, uh, composed of now 55 member states headquartered in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, where we all uh, tend to travel and engage with. And the purpose uh, of the AU is precisely aligned with the ideas of Pan-Africanism that I mentioned earlier on. And so it is in a sense an institutionalization uh, of, of, of the, 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 the ideas of Pan-Africanism. 
key institutions like the Constitutive Act of the AU, very important. The protocol established in the Peace and Security Council of the African Union are, you know, indications of how this has become, uh, you know, formalized. But I want to really very briefly, before I begin to conclude, to talk about the challenges of, um, of forging a Pan-African consciousness. And I think because our continent is still plagued by very deep-seated Eurocentric civilizational agendas, which have infiltrated and remain critically and adopted by, and fortunately, a sector of our African political and economic elite, who even have governance and socioeconomic systems that have been pretty much cut and paste, <clears throat> and so they're from the colonial and era. So there's a degree of colonial continuity. There is a colonial logic still playing out on the African continent, particularly in terms of the the neoliberal economic models and the extractive agenda, which I think has failed to distribute resources uh, to improve the livelihoods of most of the people across the continent. This is really very effectively captured in uh, in uh, the Pan-Africanist Franz Fanon's uh, chapter, The Pitfalls of National Consciousness, uh, in his book, The, the Wretched of the Earth. Um, and I think this colonial continuity really is a hindrance for us. It's not insurmountable. It doesn't mean we can't overcome it and challenge the, you know, the liberal international order, which continues to uh, marginalize Africa. We, as I said, with using um, our agency as Africans, I think can address uh, and push forward a, a program to forge uh, Pan-Africanism. The leadership deficit in Africa is very well known. Our leaders have failed to address the issues. And so the citizens have to come to the fore, even though there is an adversarial relationship between um, uh, African citizens and their governments and their states, I think we very much need to begin to think about forging a Pan-African consciousness, promoting a citizenship, almost a civic Pan-Africanism as a vehicle to mobilize continent-wide leadership from the societal level to build solidarity networks across the continent to actually address <clears throat> some of the issues that we are dealing with um, at the moment. Inst instruments like the African Free Continental Free Trade Area a uh, very useful uh, proposed African Union passport would make this much easier. Uh, but I think uh, the, the onus really is on us as uh, as individuals, friends of Africa, uh, to actually uh, take on this challenge uh, moving forward. I can see uh, Eob is getting a little bit restless, so I think that might stop there, and uh, and 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 we can pick it up in the conversation. Thank you. Okay. Eob. Okay. Uh, I will keep my question. To, to the later stage, uh, but I'm really happy that you touched up on lots of several issues that I would want us to build on the conversation as we move forward. Thank you for your uh, contribution, uh, Prof. Tim. Uh, so our, I will go straight to our second speaker. Uh, in the meantime, please uh, respond to the question, what comes to your mind when you hear the word Pan-Africanism by going to menti.com, as you can see on the chat, there's a, a code that you can use to respond to that question. So our second speaker is uh, Dr. Foluke Adebesi, Associate Professor at the Law School, University of Bristol. She is the author of the recently published book, Decolonization and Legal knowledge. I have it here on my desk. I'm at the very early stage of going through it. It's quite promising. Reflections on power and possibility. It just came out last month. I think it came out last month. So I want us, I want for Luke to help us to answer some of the questions that somehow team touched upon briefly. One of the key aspects of decolonization is epistemic decolonization. Could you please use the key arguments from your book, from your latest book, uh, Decolonization and the Legal Knowledge, as a prism to comment on the ideals of Pan-Africanism over the past six decades? And how can we use this debate that you uh, put forward in your book, especially to address the issues of epistemic colonization and aspiring for epistemic freedom. So, okay, you have the floor. You have seven minutes. <laughs> seven minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Eob, for um, inviting me and for that lovely introduction. And it always gladdens my heart to see my book in people's hands. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a weird and wonderful feeling. Um, 
So, because I've got seven minutes and as everyone knows, uh, for lawyers, seven minutes is about how much we spend talking about our preamble. Uh, I'm just going to go dive straight into it. So the question is uh, uh, for me to use the key arguments of the book uh, to as prism to comment on the ideals and practices of uh, Pan-Africanism. Pan so I'm just going to uh, first summarize the key arguments of the book so that it makes sense. And then I will make those comments. And it's very, uh, very lovely that uh, Professor Maruthi has talked about the practices and ideals of Pan-Africanism. So I don't need really to go over those. Uh, so with the book, I think one of my um, key motivators was actually the misuse of decolonization, uh, in, uh, especially in the UK, but mostly in the global north as a sort of a tool of curricular, cur curricular design, which then misses out uh, very many of the things that Prof Professor Maruthi talked about, about you know, liberation and solidarity, the need for, uh, you know, for there to be a change from the extractive uh, logics or the re remnants or the reproduction of colonial logics, especially as they uh, affect the continent. So I think my first, um, my first argument was to clarify why the demand to decolonize continues to remain uh, relevant and then next try and define decolonization because I think a lot of the reasons why there's this problem in uh, embedding decolonization is because people don't know what it is. They don't sort of understand the uh, colonial logics that people are refusing and repudiating or reacting to. Um, but also because obviously as a lawyer, I, uh, I, I thought it was important to examine the way in which the law itself is complicit in reproducing them. So say, for example, the ways in which international law uh, maintains the global north, global south, or what we call the global north and what we call the global south, how international law uh, maintains those lines. And how this is maintained in the language and meanings of law, for example, uh, how the law defines the human, how the law defines land, and how the law has distorted uh, the meaning of land and space and property as a means to dispossess uh, Africans from their land and from their resources. So it's not just uh, a question of changing laws or uh, changing practices, but also changing epistemics, which goes uh, very much to your question. Um, and, and then finally, uh, some thoughts of how the law school can respond. Now, epistemic decolonization is important in that sense, and it's very much uh, at the heart of the book, because what, I'm, what I was uh, uh, arguing is that the very meanings that the law produces are the things that have been used to dispossess Africans through questions of citizenship. Where do we belong? What, what do we belong to? But also understanding from an African perspective, uh, the breadth of the diaspora. So not just in, uh, you know, through the practice of racialized enslavement, but also through uh, processes of disper uh, dispersal and migration, how Africa has become uh, more than uh, existing on the continent. So, Epistemic decolonization, I think it, it's, it's important to be quite uh, emphatic about what the practices of decolonization, the practices of Pan-Africanism, what they are reacting to, um, how colonial logics have been used to dispossess and how uh, without re, uh, re-evaluating, re-understanding, rethinking those uh, what we often think as normal, as this is the way the world is, this is the way the world works, is actually what is reproducing uh, these uh, disparities, injustices, and continued dispossession. Therefore, it is important to think about any move towards liberation and solidarity has to repudiate those colonial logics as they continue. And my particular focus in the book is on three things, as I've already mentioned. What does it mean to be human? How do we, uh, within Pan-Africanism, how do we recapture the distortion, the misuse, the instrumentalization of the human that has resulted in, among other things, racialized enslavement, dispossessive colonization, and the continuations 
of the effects and outcomes of uh, all of that. Secondly, what does it mean to be human in space and time? So what does it mean to live on the earth? So not only are we, uh, or should we be concerned with the dispossession that results from uh, sort of uh, the dispossession of people from their land, but also what, what's called the resource, uh, resource course, but also the uh, looming uh, environmental endanger endangerment, which is uh, as a result, uh, among other things, of the overexploitation of African lands and resources, and the fact that uh, African uh, countries who have not contributed to environmental disaster are the ones who are suffering it the most. And finally, uh, what it means to be human in this time and how the concepts of language like development, um, developing nations, uh, such as those actually misrepresent what has happened and how uh, development itself or the countries that have developed have been contingent on the dispossession and underdevelopment of um, uh, the what they call the underdeveloped nations. But we should uh, it, so in in understanding um, epistemic decolonization, the questions are so what do we, you know, what are the needs going forward? There is, I think, uh, an exceptional loss of Pan African solidarity, especially in the present day. Uh, and that can be, I think, recaptured through uh, epistemic decolonization, a re-understanding, but also education uh, across the continent continent of who we are, what we mean to each other. Uh, the endless diaspora wars in West Africa, very much the Jolof uh, wars, uh, even though comedic, uh, I think they, they illustrate the underlying mistrust that has developed over the years. So there needs that there are structural needs of uh, education which must be built into uh, into this process. So, for example, how do we share knowledge? What platforms uh, do we share knowledge uh, of on, like the internet, or do we have books? Do we have enough resources to do that? How do we work together to build new bodies of knowledge? And how do we uh, practice the enactment? of Pan-Africanism on the continent, but also across all Africans and African descended people wherever they find themselves. And I think these are the key needs of epistemic decolonization. And I will stop there. Uh, according to my time, I'm only 40 minutes, 40 seconds over. <laughs> thank you, Ian. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for looking. That's brilliant. And uh, I'm sure people will get more excited and uh, interested to read your book and to use it in their academic endeavor, either as researchers, students, or as teachers. But I'm sure they may also have some questions for you as well. So please use the Q&A function on the webinar to raise your questions directed to Tim or Yirga, uh, Tim or Foluke. Yirga will be our third speaker. Unfortunately, our third speaker, uh, Ms. Acheng Akena, uh, could not join us, but, uh, uh, will continue. Before I go forward, uh, I just would like to share where we have gone so far with regard to our world cloud. So this is where we are at the moment. If you can see, there are lots of ideas forwarded. So resistance, unity, strengths, determination, problematic self-determination, fairness, citizens' movement, liberation. These are some of the ideas that people put forward that comes to their mind when they see the word Pan-Africanism. So I wonder if that can change or change over time, at least through so this, so the time of this seminar, this webinar. So let's go to our third speaker, Dr. Yirga Galau Uh Dr. Yirga is, uh, he is a senior lecturer and multidisciplinary researcher and writer based at Curtin University Center for Human Rights Education in Australia. He's also an author of a book called Native Colonialism. And uh, I would like to hear from him somehow slightly different, but not unrelated topic with what Poluke had addressed earlier. So my question to Yirga is, could you please base your contribution on what kinds of colonization Africa 
has been facing, even at the moment, and what are the manifestation and what role can an African ideas and practices play in challenging this, this subtle nature of uh, present day colonial uh, relations. So Yurga, you have the floor, you have seven minutes. Uh, thank you, Eyo. Thank you for the organizers. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Okay. Um, let me just start by um, acknowledging where I am. Uh, I am at the Wajuk people of the Nunga nation. Uh, this is uh, the Nunga people who lived in this land. Uh, their sovereignty was never ceded. And uh, I would like to pay my respect to the uh, indigenous uh, owners of the land and respect their elders past, present, and emerging because um, many people may not know, but uh, 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 Australians, uh, original Australians are uh, black people who uh, are or have been and are still um, uh, struggling against colonialism to achieve uh, dignity and rights in this, in this land, uh, which is still uh, colonized. Uh, my, I'd like to start by reading a quote from um, Amikhan Kabran, uh, where he said, uh, uh, we are not interested in the preservation of any of the structures of the colonial states. It is our opinion that it is necessary to totally destroy, to break, reduce to ash, all aspects of the colonial state in our country, to make everything possible for our people. The problem of the nature of the state created after independence is perhaps the secret of the failure of African independence. Um, I chose to say this because when you ask me what are the uh, complex, what are the uh, challenges that Africa, uh, in Africa we face, I think I, I, I kind of feel ambivalent when I think of uh, Pan-Africanism. Um, and most of the initiatives that have happened um, in recent times or, or in the past. This is mainly because what Africans were trying to do through Pan-Africanism was partly uh, to rightfully uh, reject the colonial thesis, the racial oppression, and fight against that system. But in terms of articulating the cultural basis of Pan-Africanism, what the people uh, in Africa, through their experience, lived for or lived by, uh, there were uh, obvious limitations. So we see, we, we, we enter into a process of nation building, a process of expanding education, a process of economic development, all activities without really anchoring them on uh, the lived experiences, cultures, and traditions of our people. This may be caused by various serious uh, challenges that has to do with colonialism's effect on culture, but uh, nonetheless, it doesn't change the fact that the uh, post-colonial, so-called post-colonial period of Africa become a continuation of colonialism for the reasons I mentioned earlier. So I kind of think that one of the biggest challenges that has happened on the continent was the good things that are being implemented in the continent are often in one way or another counterproductive as they lack the cultural legitimacy, the capacity to become owned by uh, local Africans. And I want to take an example in relation to, for instance, uh, the African movement to create independent nations or nation building agendas, uh, expanding education, and also economic growth. I think when Anikal Cabral said about the liquidation or the destruction of the state itself, and I think this relates to the notion of the nation or the nation itself as a concept, as a concept to organize Africans as uh, political uh, agents. And 
if we go back in history and reflect on the origin of Pan-Africanism in the, in the 18th century, to be exact, to be exact in 1784 uh, in America, uh, enslaved Africans went out of the church, which was controlled by uh, uh, the white um, church leaders. They created their own independent church. It was that church was called the uh, Ethiopian Baptist Church or the Ethiopian Evangelical Baptist Church. So the idea was to kind of find a space to reflect on being African, being black, but at the same time also, uh, you know, uh, use the gospel for their own cause. But that kind of culture-based Pan-Africanism was later uh, uh, changed eventually into a kind of nationalism which is conceptualized based on the concept of the nation that came uh, originally from Europe. Although in Africa, there were other concepts of organizing society uh, as nations or as communities or as kingdoms, this concept of an idea of the nation was a colonial and a Eurocentric concept, which is, has become so difficult to get rid of uh, uh, in Africa in particular. So if you think of the nation and where it comes from, it originates from a European medieval peace movement, where especially during the Crusades, the peace of God, the idea of this peace of God, which means that killing the enemy of um, Christian was regarded as a, a holy thing. Uh, there was in the, in the 11th century, uh, people were, troubled by so many crimes, the inability of the kings to avoid violence, then they come together and try to justify the ability to attack, to kill people who are not Christians. So they said, um, whoever spills a Christian's blood is spilling Christ's blood. So fighting against the enemy of Christians is fighting against the enemy of God. And that idea of fighting the other, which is a non-Christian, become a basis to launch crusades and later to launch colonialism by the popes in Europe who wrote papal bulls, especially the uh, Dum Diversas in 1452, uh, where a pope wrote Afri uh, to uh, um, a Portuguese king, uh, Alfonso, giving Africa as a property to rule the people, to use them as slaves. And then eventually, and it goes to Latin America, where uh, the America was also given as, as a property to Spain and Portugal. So what we see in all of this is this concept of the nation conceptualized within a European Christian thinking, justifying the killing of anyone or the colonization of anyone that doesn't fit into this, this picture. This was solidified and come in Africa in 1885 through the Berlin Conference, where participants were saying that they are coming to Africa to save the primitive races and to bring civilization for them. So that notion of a civilizing nation or burden of the white man. So this concept of the nation was a, an idea that came from that notion of Christianity and the notion of civilization, which always sees others uh, which are outside of uh, the orbit of the nation as primitive and subject to colonization. I cannot go in detail to go further in the historical process, but if you consider the League of Nations, the Trusteeship Council, the Security Council in the uh, United Nations, uh, the use of uh, colonial customs and practices as sources of international law, all of these structures come together to formulate a concept, a foreign concept of a nation as the only legitimate way of organizing society. And of course, as a result of that, knowledge production and also economic development or economic growth, all of this also contributes to a nation. The problem with the nation, again, is that it doesn't, it does not have a cultural root and the capacity to bring diverse populations together as indigenous African traditions did. Uh, when people were living diverse lives. So to just conclude uh, uh, in general, uh, there is a very important concept that um, Ngungi Wationgo 
uh, wrote on his book, Decolonizing the Mind. And he said there's a, a fundamentally serious consequence of all the colonial system and uh, uh, the consequence in the post-colonial Africa is this creation of the cultural boom. He called it a cultural boom. He said the effect of the cultural boom is to annihilate a people's belief in their names, in their languages, in their capacities, and ultimately in themselves. Africans' inability to believe in their indigenous cultures and indigenous institutions and languages and knowledges, the lack of confidence in themselves manifests this uh, uh, cultural bomb, or in my own way, which I call cognitive slavery. So we live in a cognitive plantation where the plantation is practiced through the cultivation of a process of nation building, that idea of a nation that externalizes so many people, and the idea of creating a right to Western education, right to education is not a right to African education or African languages, or we don't produce knowledge to serve Africans, we produce knowledge to serve our colonial or capitalist masters. So there is that knowledge production and economic development and growth where Africa is seen as a terra nullius or empty land and uh, nations are organized as corporations so that they can decolonize and, and used for the advantage of non-Africans. And together, all of this, I think, gives us a picture of a cognitive slavery where even when we succeed to, in building nations, in expanding schools, in having PhDs, we continue to be alienated and be distanced from our own people. That is why a kind of radical form of decolonization is a, a, a necessary condition or a prerequisite to kind of think of the type of Pan-Africanism that may be suitable for all of us. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for your uh, thought-provoking ideas, taking us back to the historical issues and also linking it to what's currently happening. And uh, I hope our participants will have lots of questions and comments, even connecting the dots from what Professor Mwichi has highlighted and what Professor Debesi mentioned and also what Girga has already emphasized. Uh, I'm really happy to see uh, our uh, speaker Achenga Kena is already uh, in the in the room, in the virtual room. Aching, are you, I know you joined us late, so are you ready to go next? Can you hear me? Hi, Eob. Um, hey. I can hear you, but I, I'm sorry. It seems I got the timings mixed up no um, in terms of BM, BST and GMT. <laughs> um, and so now I'm a little um, I'm a little disorganized because I'm not sure what other people have spoken about and whether I would necessarily be repeating yeah. what if has feel, already been said. If you feel comfortable to go forward, I can I, I can do so. If not, I will uh, I will go for some questions and answer because everyone all the other panels have already spoken. So then probably you can come in just by way of contributing to the to the discussion. Is that okay with you? Yes, that's okay with me. And I can make any additional comments I have. Exactly. Yes, I will give you more time to do so. Thank okay, you. great. So everyone, uh, we started with some historical background about Pan-Africanism from uh, Tim and uh, Foluke gave us some practical evidence and manifestation of colonialism in today's world and how Pan-Africanism, Pan-African ideas can help us address those issues and Yirga also gave us some broader context of how some of these Eurocentric ideas somehow integrated into even those so-called emancipatory or liberationary movements and ideas and practices. There is one particular question. Uh, is there any question so far? No, I can't see any question. So guys, I really encourage you to for your questions into the q and a section uh i want to ask one question to uh professor tim ruti 
one thing that I would hear, I would like to hear from you is the extent to which, okay, the extent to which these Pan-African ideas, I remember reading your, your piece back written in back in 2007 about the different institutionalizations of Pan-Africanism. And I wonder to what extent the change, like at least the emergence of the OAU and now the AU has helped Africa as a political actor, a political entity to play its role within the global political economic context, within the context of international affairs or global affairs. Do you see Pan-African ideas shaping that or is it something quite disorganized and very much out in the out in the scattered and everything is happening just on the go? Do you see any structured contribution from the ideas? Yes, I, I think turning the ideas into institutions is always is never easy because the you know the ideal and the aspiration um is often almost always never achieved so we have we have a lot of ideals and we have aspirations as to where we would like to see the african continent and the institutions that are tasked with getting us there the african union and before it obviously the organization of african uh, unity and today we have a continent with uh, almost 20 simmering uh, violent conflicts um exceptionally uh catastrophic situation in sudan right now mm -hmm. uh mozambique central african republic historically uh, ethiopia just uh, hopefully emerging out of a difficult situation uh violent extremism in the west of the continent so and one of the things that's clear is that um despite all of the rhetoric the institution of the african union is still struggling in fact to address these crises. Um, a very important case in point is the situation in the Sahel, where now there's almost, in fact, no clear sense of a direction as to what needs to be done. Um, but the institutions, nevertheless, having said that, are still very important in, um, in assisting us to actually come together to at least speak together. We not, might not be sharing the same mindset. We might not be speaking from the same song sheet, but we are at least sitting around and trying to get some things done. I would say, as I, as I said in my introduction, the fact that Pan-African consciousness is not yet sufficiently activated across our continent is a big issue. So um, there is a really much more to be done. I mean, if we, if we look at one or two cases where perhaps we can say the AU has now played a, an important role the most recent one is the, the terrible pandemic that the world faced and the AU, the African continent, essentially seemed to be almost left to its own devices to deal with, uh, you know, mitigating the, 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 the COVID-19 uh, virus. And the African Union did come together, developed a strategy, uh, started to source, uh, you know, uh, vaccines. And there was a clear sense from the African perspective that there was a kind of a vaccine apartheid or a vaccine, an exclusionary vaccine policy emerging from countries in the global north, which really looked after for themselves first, rather than even sharing. Some countries had more than they actually needed and were not keen on sharing. And it was clear that Africa is on its own. Um, and that, even that effort, even though we did lose people, we still a continent where the fewest number of people, in fact, were affected by the virus. Um, does not take away from the other challenges we have, poverty and employment and so on and so forth. Um, but it is an indication that when we put our minds together as a continent, we can push certain agendas through. We have an African continental free trade area, which still needs to be, you know, leveraged by uh, both governments and people, I would say people. Um, you know, we have, uh, we have a number of these processes uh, that actually can that demonstrate that there is value to having an institution that tries to corral, you know, the Pan-African sentiment. Um, but even at the African Union, I would say, the word Pan-Africanism is not often heard being referenced, which is very interesting. 
so we even have work to actually do to sensitize, raise awareness, and encourage people to actually embrace their Pan-Africanism, actually embrace it and activate it and make it come alive, live it as a, as a, as a living identity. And the African Union passport would be a huge step in the right direction to enable 1.2, 1.3 billion people to be able to travel freely across our continent. Uh, that would be a huge uh, you know, step in the right direction. And, and that is simply due to lack of uh, you know, um, bureaucratic uh, lethargy and inertia, which has prevented it from, from, from being adopted. But I don't think we can also leave the people out of this equation. Mm -hmm. The African people have a role to actually light a fire underneath their own institutions. Do not simply accept the, and, and uh, expect the institutions to function. Um, if we as African people and friends of Africa are not actually directly engaging, questioning, calling out, criticizing um, the institutions. I said there was an African leadership deficit. The majority of the so-called leaders in Africa seem to be much more interested in their own self-interest than in the interests of their own peoples and their societies and the improvement of their own economies and communities. Um, and so there is a lot of work to be done, I would say, in terms of animating these institutions. They will not animate themselves. We cannot all leave it to the African Union system, especially the commission in Addis Ababa, to actually do all the heavy lifting. We all have a responsibility to actually engage, even if it's as simple as retweeting a hashtag, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that is a step in the right direction. Eo. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I will then raise a question from, from the participants to, for, for Luke to address. Perhaps after that, I think, I hope you have kind of gathered the sense of the discussion so far. So yes. after after for Luke, I would I would uh, ask you to take the floor. So one, there are two questions that I want you to respond to uh, for Luke. Uh, there are three, in fact. So decolonization is an ongoing process. Yes, but what is the arrival point? Or oh, are African intellectuals and post-colonial African nations? entrapped in a never-ending journey? This is a question that I want you to respond to. Plus, there's one question. You mentioned about education being as one particular channel that can use that can be used to build this Pan-African solidarity uh, as we move forward, and also by producing new bodies of knowledge. But the intervention from Yirga considers the current status, orientation, and practice, and institutionalization of education by itself as one colonial project, which has somehow been used as an instrument of alienating people from who they are in terms of their language, in terms of their culture, and everything. So when you say education to be used, where do you put uh, your gas reflection, critical insights into the current nature of and practice organization of education in the continent. You have the floor. Um, thank you for those two questions. So the first question is, what's the end point of decolonization? And I think for me, this is why it is very important, uh, uh, this, this sort of uh, reflection, is why it is very important to define decolonization, I think decolonization is impossible to define, but if we are going to talk about decolonization to understand it as a measure uh, or as a response to colonial logics. So as long as the colonial logics continue to exist, then decolonization continues to be necessary. If there were no colonial logics existing, then decolonization will cease to be important. Uh, and I think for very many people, and again, very much speaking from my position as an academic uh, in what is designated the global north, the, the idea, especially uh, in the context of, you know, after the uprisings, rebellions, resistances of the summer of 2020, people go, well, haven't you finished decolonizing now? Uh, that idea of have, wanting decolonization to be over with 
does not appreciate the magnitude of the task that we are uh, that we are faced with. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, very much as Yega was saying, uh, the colonial state uh, as a outcome, reproduction, result of colonialism, um, makes us believe that when we talk about decolonization, we are talking about the world as it is now, but just a little bit more equal. But when we read the writings of decolonization, especially from a Pan-Africanist point of view, what we're really talking about is uh, creating or constructing new worlds, new ways of thinking, new ways of being, new ways of doing. And so I would think of decolonization not as a destination, but actually as a way of being, as a way of being that constantly continues to refuse the colonial logics of dispossession and dehumanization produced by this ongoing project. And that, that would be my sort of roundabout answer to that first question, that it's, I don't think it's never ending, but if we define it, if we're trying to find the end of it, then we're not actually appreciating the task. The task is to respond to a project of extraction and dehumanization that continues to re reproduce itself. And therefore we have to continue to reproduce our resistances and our refusals of it. Uh, and your second question, I, I completely uh, agree with uh, Jürgen and you know, it's, it is, I, uh, I often feel uh, uh, education uh, double-edged uh, sword. Um, one of the first things I wrote about decolonization ages ago was uh, decolonizing education. Uh, and specifically for that reason, the fact that uh, we recognize that, uh, we should recognize that education, as we often understand it, has been used as a tool of epistemic colonization. Um, in how Europe underdeveloped Africa, Walter Rodney has a beautiful chapter on education uh, and which sort of resonates with most of the things that the panelists have said uh, already, how uh, the methods of epistemic colonization were used to make us not recognize uh, who we were. And therefore, how can you uh, um, strive for freedom, work together, if the bonds of knowledge of who we are are broken through the processes of education. So education has definitely been uh, a, uh, a structure of colonization. But when I talk about education, I always want us to think about it in wider terms because the, the presumption of some people there uh, in this sort of conversation is that there was no education on the continent before the arrival of the Europeans. We were just sort of sitting around in trees and not producing knowledge. Uh, and so when we talk about education, I, I think there's, there's also a, a reclamation uh, to be had there of the structures of education, of knowledge, uh, and not just the structures, but also the ideals of knowledge uh, cultivation. I don't, I don't necessarily like uh, the phrase knowledge production. So sort of the ideals of knowledge cultivation as a, uh, as a together endeavor that we use to um, uh, sort of reclaim some of the lost knowledges, but also build knowledges for the future. Because my understanding of decolonization of knowledge is that we take, we try and re reclaim the things that are lost. So the things that are lost to the past, reclaim them to help us understand the present, but the purpose is to build a better future for us all and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks a lot for looking. Uh, thank you for your response. So I'll give the floor to Achen to put forward her ideas, but I believe the one question that she can also respond to when she raises, uh, when she contributes. So Achen is the Executive Director for the International Refugee Rights Initiative. She's a Kenyan. She's a lawyer and human rights and democracy practitioner. She's joining us from the continent. And one thing that I would attempt to respond to is based on your extensive experience as a human rights and democracy activist and practitioner, 
Could you please speak on the role of African social movements, citizens' movements, and engagement with the ideals and practice of Pan Africanism? Whilst doing so, I think there's one question that probably also resonates to this question. Uh, uh, so I think Henok Tadessa read the question. Uh, read the question. Thank you all for your very insightful presentation. Which African institution holds the best hope of realizing the Pan African perspective and ideals? The state? Grassroots organizations, supranationals like the AU, which of these present the major stumbling block, not only uh, contributing, but also hindering the ideals of Pan Africanism. So, I think uh, you have the floor to respond to all this vis a vis your contribution. Okay, so thank you so much, Ayub. Um, and again, my apologies for coming late into the conversation, and I apologize if I repeat things that may have already been covered by my other panelists. Um, I think for me, the starting point is that Pan-Africanism was always a people's project before it became an institution. Um, when the leaders of the 60s were busy uh, struggling with turning our colonial economic projects into uh, political units in terms of nation states, um, they were not interested in an African unity. And Kwame Nkrumah and his frustration first organized people. There were people's congresses before the, before the, the meeting that established the OAU. Uh, somehow, Pan-Africanism then became institutionalized in the body of the EU. Um, and while there were some efforts to keep alive uh, Africanism before the institution, it has become very much entrenched in um, the AU as a body and its institutions. But I think that um, um, we need to uh, separate um, the Pan Africanist ideals from the Pan African institution, even though the institution is the structure. Um, I think it's, I call it our multi-billion dollar framework <laughs> for implementing Pan-Africanism. Um, it remains to me more of, and, and Tim has had me say this before, it remains to me more of an aspirational project than a reality. Um, uh, Dr. Chidi Odinkala recently wrote that uh, the African Union is neither African nor is it a union. Um, and I must agree because a union implies that there is certain elements of sovereignty that are going to be given up for the sake of the collective. But we find that many things don't work because states still hold on to their sovereignty um, and do not allow the African Union to grow into a body or a structure that could adequately respond um, to what is needed by Africans. Um, and, you know, I, I keep saying that even our 50 year agenda is an aspirational agenda. Um, you know, we keep talking about aspiration one and aspiration two. Uh, we cannot build uh, African unity on aspirations. At some point, um, we have to get off uh, the aspirational bandwagon and make sure that uh, what we're instituting with our multi billion dollar uh, AU policy, for policy and institutional framework actually reflects the reality on the ground. Um, and that this multi-billion dollar institutional framework is also able to respond to the needs of Africa's people, whether it's for peace, whether it's for health, whether it's for well-being, and show real value when it matters. Um, look at the situations that we've had recently in Ethiopia and Sudan. We are fronting U.S. brokered solutions as so-called African solutions. That's the reality of it. Um, Sudan, our, our African Union, seems absolutely paralyzed to be able to respond to a situation which it itself um, uh, had initially suspended Sudan uh, uh, because of being uh, oh, suspended Sudan, indicating its its acknowledgement of the illegitimacy of the people who are now warring in the country. And yet beyond that, um, 
despite the fact that we have an entire African peace and security architecture, um, we have a whole bunch of uh, uh, artillery weapons being fired on our city. Uh, a populated city, we have people stranded. We have an entire humanitarian agency, and yet people are starving to death uh, as they try to escape this conflict. This is so. Well, definitely, this is not the idea behind Pan Africanism. This is not why uh, Pan Africanism uh, uh, was an inspiration for Africa's unity. And there must be some accountability for the billion of billions of dollars that have been spent on this institution uh, to make it responsive to what people need. These, you know, these, these kinds of situation of what is happening in Sudan is precisely why billions of dollars were, were put into setting up, say, the Africa Standard Force, um, or into setting up, you know. Uh, uh, a panel of the wise and so forth and so on. These have the mechanisms, but somehow they're not applied in a way where they it actually matters uh, to people. Um, and I, I think for me, the, the dichotomy between policy and reality um, can be seen most if we look at the free movement uh, agenda. A uh, free movement of people is um, a necessary component of regional integration. Um, and yet, the countries have gone ahead and ratified the Africa Free Continental uh, Trade Area and not ratified the free movement protocol. So, what's supposed to happen? Goods and services are supposed to walk themselves across the border. Um, maybe someone was saying drones, maybe drones can drop off goods, but <laughs> services? How are services going to have are going to move if people cannot move? Um, so you have this very um, schizophrenic uh, uh, outcomes that we see at at this top policy level. Another one is around alternative sources of financing. I think the AU has been talking about alternative sources of financing for two decades. Up until today, we still have 70% of the AU budget being covered by the EU and 90% of the peacekeeping budget being covered externally. And this kind of um, externally resource uh, 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 institutions um, also adds to the paralysis that we're seeing right now. They don't have the money to respond, so they're just going to sit down and fiddle their thumbs and produce statements every other day without taking real action. To, 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 to keep people safe and to protect people. Um, and so you, all these you know, inconsistencies make Pan-Africanism um, become nothing more, at least the Pan-Africanism as a principle of Africa's self-reliance and emergence becomes nothing more than um, you know, valueless rhetoric that's uh, uh, more important for external power plays uh, than for we, the people who actually need Pan Africanism to be um, our reality. Um, so um, I think another another um, example I would give is um, when we as uh, when the outcome social movement, because that's 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 an easier word to use. But you have a lot of people who have a passion for the continent who have been engaging these institutions for several years. And the truth of the fact is, uh, at least in my engagement with, with the AU, is that if you don't push, if you don't push these institutions, they don't grow. Um, a lot of the institutions that we have seen that have had the um, biggest, uh, 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 let's say, the biggest results and the biggest faces, the, um, the biggest results are the ones that have the biggest spaces for Africans to participate. Um, my colleague John always used to say that the quality and the quantity, the quality of laws, institutions, frameworks that we get as Africans will always be directly proportional to African people's engagements with those institutions. And so, for example, if you've seen the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, it's one of the most open institutions, but the one that has gone furthest in terms of protecting the human rights of people. And that's because we've consistently engaged in that space. But if you can only, it sometimes feels like you are hitting your head against the wall when you engage with the AU. 
first and foremost, let's talk about the expense of engaging the AI. Um, it constantly means going to places like Addis, Banjo, um, and as an institution, um, unless you're set up specifically to engage in that space, it can become prohibitive because there's summits, there's sessions, uh, there are all these different countries, and to consistently engage every single AU body, institutions, sessions, or summits can be, can take up your entire year. Um, just attending the summits and the sessions. Um, and then you go there and, uh, so for example, if you would like to go to Addis, first, unless you're Kenyan, um, you have to first find a visa to get into Addis. If you do get a visa to get into Addis, um, you need a security code to get into the AU to be able to speak to anybody. So, um, Unless you, 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 someone has taken you there before and you now know somebody in the AU, you cannot decide as a, a Kenyan organization that you're suddenly going to engage in the AU because you'll never get to see or talk to anybody. Um, so when they say, I am the African Union, I'm not the African Union. <laughs> you don't have access to this space. Uh, and this is really a challenge. Um, and also in terms of social social structures uh, engaging, I, I won't even go into talking about how difficult it is to get to Banjo, just in terms of infrastructure and availability of flight. That's a whole other section. Most of the time, it's easier to fly to Europe to get to Banjo than to actually go through through, through uh, uh, Africa. So um, I think in terms of social movements, you have the passion for the continent, have the passion for the institution, but then the institution isn't giving back. It's closing spaces. Um, when, when they decided, for example, to cease interference with the sessions in the summit uh, by external actors, they threw everybody out, even African civil society. And yet we only used to stand in the corridor <laughs> and thanks for an ear. But we got thrown out as well because we're we're seen as foreign. Um, the kinds of difficult relationships that countries have with the citizens at the national level. Um, compact. Somebody said to me today that uh, the dysfunction of our fifty-five countries compact themselves into a single institution and somehow escalate. And so those those um, difficulties that countries have with their citizens, the fear that they have for their citizens and their citizen information reflects itself at the AU level. And you now had um, a lot of suspicions about who who are you as a uh, as if you go to the AU, they'll be like, who are you? Where are you registered? Where, there's a lot of questions before the AU will engage with you as a as a, as a formator. Um, okay, sorry, I think I have to cut you short. Okay, can I say just one more thing? Please make it brief. Okay. Yes, very brief. But we, but despite that, we have been able to make inroads into these institutions like we have with the Livingstone formula. And we have gotten to push back uh, and get some of our institutions responding better to our African problems. Okay, great. Thank you, Aching. Uh, the reason why I wanted you your contribution into this discussion is to speak about this practical challenge that engaging with the institutionalized feature of Pan-Africanism, especially in the continent, to show the picture about that. Yes, we can talk about the intellectual, the conceptual debates about Pan-Africanism and decolonization, but this is the lived experience and realities of people on the continent, especially who like to push for change in the policy domains, in the legal frameworks and everything. So I really appreciate the time that you took to, to reflect on this from your personal experience. So I know we are running out of time, we're supposed to finish in 12 minutes time, but there's one particular question that especially that our, uh, our uh, uh, panelists want, I would want to, them to respond to. Somebody asked the question, Gabriel how colonization has affected the culture of production and productivity? Uh, that's one question. Uh, there's another question about someone uh, lives, who's living in the UK, Sh uh, Shama Ben 
Ben Mira. As an African family living outside of Africa in the UK, how does one push and help promote Pan-African philosophy in the minds of life ingrained in a Eurocentric world and hectic life? We contribute to this economy, a way of life, rather than contribute to the progression of Pan-African philosophy. How do we, I hope, work together at the diaspora and really try to improve our presence and future? I think the awareness of our ancient history is a great starting point. I think this is something that probably our host, Daniel Meyer, reflect on and also the, the research that he's working on. So, Dirga, can you reflect on the question what extent colonization has affected the culture of production and productivity? I wonder how you all understand this question. Very brief, two minutes maximum or three minutes. Um, yes, I think um, I don't know uh, what what the, the 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 person the, the person who asked the question mean by production for activity, but I think um, I think when we come when we look at what is being done in in uh, knowledge in education, what we see is production. Uh, we're not seeing uh, people transmitting their cultures. Uh, learning uh, uh, um, from their experiences. But what we see are institutions producing knowledge that can be marketed, and institutions patenting knowledge that can be used. Uh, so it would, it would be, it would have been good if education was a process of exchanging ideas and knowledges and cultivating uh, consciousness uh, or Pan-African consciousness, but that is not happening in, the, in reality. Uh, institutions are there uh, in, in the process of reproducing uh, subjects that can be exploited. And I think one of the most important points in this regard is to think about decolonization not as something that we go out and do it uh, uh, out there, but also as something that we have to do it on ourselves. Uh, what gave us the right to speak on subjects uh, using a colonial language uh, by itself uh, should be questioned. We, we really need to uh, be able to ask our audience who is using our knowledge, who is using our language, for whom are we doing research? Uh, what are these uh, so kind of I, I wouldn't call it privilege, but a kind of privilege that we think uh, we have uh, to speak about people uh, without using their language and experiences. So that colonial identity is within us and decolonization is very much about, about ourselves. Uh, so we reproduce ourselves through ideas, through knowledges that do not serve our people. We may write, we may supervise students, we may teach, but if it is not related to our people, uh, uh, it wouldn't really address the issues. And I just want to add one last point. That is that when I think about these ideas about Pan-Africanism or decolonization, I often reflect based on a place where I come from, which is Ethiopia. And if you think about Ethiopia, I see it as a place that is divided, as Francis Fulon said, into a zone of being and a zone of non-being. It's a place where people consider living in a zone of being are those like us who are you know, intellectuals who are not really connected with uh, uh, living on, producing on the culture or the land, but are living in urban areas, uh, studying and trying to become like the West. And the non the zone of non-being is a place where more than 80% of Af Ethiopians live, 80%. These people uh, are rural Africans or rural Ethiopians, pastoralists, farmers. When we think about decolonization in Africa, if we don't really place ourselves at that, it, at, at epistemic level at least, at the world inhabited by these people who are living in the zone of Nanbi, we are reproducing the colonial system within ourselves and through our work. Because the colonizer can become a decolonizer. If you have an institution not controlled by the people, uh, practices and structures that are controlled by uh, 
uh, others. Whatever beautiful or critical idea or decolonization you talk about uh, cannot reach the people you, 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 want, you want to work with. So it is, it, it is fundamentally then important to think ourselves as, I think in my case at least, participants in that colonial plantation, although our tendency is to, uh, to talk about its decolonization. Uh, so the, the fundamental disconnect is our inability to articulate the, the life world that is inhabited by people who are dismissed completely from all structures of power, institutions. Uh, and, uh, and that is a fundamental problem. But if we were to try to do that, I think that is where we come back to reflect and contribute genuinely what would be a decolonized or a genuinely African way of uh, 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 developing or living together would be. Okay. Uh, at this point, uh, I know there are lots of questions that have already been raised, but some of the questions are already being answered from your uh, interventions, both the, the last intervention by Yirga and also by Achen. I just want to read one comment by Nama Boakaye. Thank you for our research question. One thing that struck me was our last speaker who said Africans lack belief in their language. This was in response to the, the intervention by Irga. I think this is a mortal threat to Africans. It is about time Africans decolonize their official language and do whatever it takes to adopt indigenous African language as the official language as opposed to the colonizer's language. I think the role of language in terms of uh, painting a bigger picture across society, if, if to be used as a medium of instruction in, in our universities, as a medium of cultivating knowledge is very important because one thing that colonization has managed to do is to render African language irrelevant and incapable or inadequate to produce uh, scientific knowledge and to make them subservient to the colonially imposed language. So I think that kind of ideas would definitely be important to push forward if we want to see the real uh, practice of pursuing Pan-African ideas and practices. Uh, we are almost finishing. I just want to give one minute each for each speaker. I will start from Tim, then go to for Luke and a change just to to say your final words before we finish and wrap it off. Just please stick to one minute. And I know it's we, saw, we, touched about, we touched on lots of things, but in one minute, how would you like people attending this session to think about Pan-Africanism? Uh, thank you very much, Eop. Uh, it's been a really great conversation. Uh, just to say, yes, I think the, the, the one point that's emerging is the importance of self-transformation self-reflection, mm -hmm. self-transformation. Um, Pan-Africanism can only grow if you yourself as an individual actually take the initiative to do so. So you need to activate your Pan-African consciousness, activate your Pan-African identity, and that will then radiate to people around you, you know, in your role, in your family, in your community setting. And the African Union has actually adopted the Kiswahili as an official language of the of the union, so we we are in that journey towards indigenization, uh, and uh, a link to that, I believe, uh, there's a lot that we can learn from our own uh, African spirituality as well, and and draw from our connectedness to the land, and you know notions of our collective being Ubuntu ness, and so on and so forth. But let me end there and say, I think now is the time to push for Pan Africanism. It's great that the center is up and running, I would say sprinting. And I just want to congratulate Dr. Mulugeta and the team, Yenka, Abdul, uh, Sunil, for actually this very important initiative. And this is the time to push forward towards Pan-Africanism. Thanks, Yo. Thank you, thank you, Tim. Uh, for Luke, you have one minute to wrap up and pass your final message. <laughs> Thank you, Ayub. I'll try and keep it simple. Um, it's been it's been a fantastic time. I'm so I'm so uh, sort of blessed to be in conversation with everyone, uh, including the uh, participants online as well as the panelists. Um, 
uh, to keep it simple, I would say two things. Um, we need to keep on learning about what Pan-African history is and thinking about what the future can be. And secondly, uh, we need to build connections. So, and these are positive actions. These are not things that we sort of think about Pan-Africanism. We have to make deliberate choices. And I think that goes very much with what Professor Maruthi was saying. We have to make deliberate choices uh, in self uh, transformation and in building those networks to help with that self transformation. And I'll stop there. Okay, great. So somebody was asking whether we will be seeing the, the Mentimeter. So I will just show the origin, the first Mentimeter that word cloud that we built. And I just put a second question to see if there is any change. Uh, so this is the word cloud that 23 participants have contributed to what comes to their mind when they hear the word Pan-Africanism, unity, strength, resistance, African consciousness, challenge, self-determination, internationalization, African unity movement, all this. However, we hear lots of critical insights about what Pan-Africanism it really means. And uh, uh, one of the challenges is also the institutionalization. And Achen was talking about, we need to separate Pan-African ideals from the institutionalization of Pan-Africanism. So especially through so the practice and the organization of the African Union, its decision-making processes, its organs and institutions and the way that African citizens are engaging into this policy domain. So is there any change in your mind, in your thinking? Use the same code and probably contribute to this uh, platform as well. So uh, let me stop sharing. Let me give uh, a change, a final thought, final comments, based on what you've heard and based on your contribution. Just one minute to wrap up everything. Thank you so much, Eob. Um, for me, Pan-Africanism Pan has to go beyond being an ism. It has to have value to people, and it has to have a what can happen. So for example, one, make remittances easier for the diaspora. India, for example, has a non-resident Indian policy, which African country also does that, that makes it easier for Africans who are living abroad to be able to invest in their own countries. That's a simple thing you can do to enhance Pan-Africanism. Two, the AU should ensure that when it gives out consultancies or any uh, uh, knowledge production, it does so, it uses African consultants, African knowledge and builds African scholarship. That is one thing it doesn't do. We have American and European so-called experts who are producing knowledge for our institutional body. I could never work for the EU, for example. So um, the EU needs to do better about that. The third one, provide education on Pan-Africanism and decolonization on TV and radio. Our governments have the largest spread in terms of, uh, our government medias have the largest spread. I saw it once uh, where um, ECOWAS had a segment on one of the national TV stations. Why can't they do that? Have a seg segment on Pan-Africanism, have a segment on AU, what is the AU? Have a segment on decolonization. These are just simple things that if they just don't even need resources, just need a little bit of money. And there are many other examples. But so I would say uh, Pan-Africanism, yes, great, but it needs a doing, it needs to show value in order for people to be able to take it up as a people project. Thanks, Ian. Thank you, Acheng. Uh, I see that it said the voting is closed on the, on the Mentimeter. I, I really apologize for the technical glitch. I think I should have created a different slide with a different code. So let me let me go start to Dr. Yirga. What are your final thoughts in just one minute? Um, thank you. I think uh, um, uh, it's really interesting to hear all the uh, participants. Uh, be very insightful uh, ideas, uh, and I think um, I share this sentiment that we really need to work together. We often think uh, Africa. 
for Africa and African Union, but uh, we often struggle to create strong networks, uh, set our own agenda, even intellectually to discuss on issues that are affecting our people. And uh, when I think about people who started Pan-Africanism, they uh, uh, did significant meetings, discussions, planned how to what to do in the continent, often uh, um, without having institutional support from the universities and from the places where they, they, they lived. They, they paid significant sacrifices to write books, to develop new ideas, to struggle against the colonial system. And um, I think it is important to reflect on uh, a time where significant changes are happening in the world, be it the rise of um, white supremacy or AI or uh, the uh, scramble for of, um, or the uh, um, competition to influence geopolitically or resource competition and so on. Significant things are happening that affect our people. Uh, the energy that should really come from young people in Africa uh, should be uh, something that, uh, uh, that is based on what they want. And I think uh, uh, based on also um, their own uh, um, understanding and reflection on the continent, so they, we should be able to really work together. I don't really see institutions like the African Union uh, really taking that leadership in terms of challenging their own donors uh, by ideas, especially radical ideas that would enable Africans uh, to be beneficiaries of their own resources. Uh, I don't know to what extent they would go, uh, and uh, it's not because they don't want to, but the institutional constraints are there. Uh, so it's it's very concerning when young people are uh, reluctant and lost in various jargons, including decolonization and Africanism, uh, than rightly uh, focusing on the issues that they face in their own countries, the lack of freedom, and try to build an effort to change the circumstances they are in. At least intellectually, we should be able to do that. Uh, and thank you for organizing this. This is part of that, and uh, it is wonderful. Great. I really thank everyone to, for their significant, very fruitful, thought provoking contributions. Uh, on very complex issue, but everyone addressed it from a very uh, interesting point of interest. And I really would like to thank our host, uh, Dr. Daniel Mulgeta at, uh, at SOAS uh, in, for his project Pan African uh, Frontiers and Identities. I hope this was a very uh, uh, exciting opportunity for most of us who are very much excited, interested, and somehow committed to the ideals of Pan Africanism. Uh, the, the conversations were quite rich. Uh, the recording of this session will be available on the websites of OSOAS and I think Pan African Frontiers Project. So, without any further ado, I would like to uh, ask Daniel if you would like to say anything before we close, and I will share the, the final uh, slide that we will build for the World Cloud. Danny, you have anything? Uh, thank you, everyone, for this uh, fantastic discussion. Uh, this has been really very insightful. Um, massive thank you to our speakers and for Yop for chairing the event. Um, so I think we need to kind of keep the conversation. So I think um, um, that's where change starts. Um, and that's that with that spirit that we are trying to launch a new center for Pan-African studies as SOAS. Uh, so we will have a launch event by the end of the year, probably October or November. So I would like uh, I would like to invite everyone to keep in touch. We are very responsive. We want the center to be uh, a hub for researchers, for policy makers, as well as for uh, the public, uh, both on the continent and the, the diaspora. So we are going to have outward facing center for Pan-African studies. We have a website called www.panafricanfrontiers.com. Uh, and you can also keep in touch uh, via our email, cpas at uh, .soas.ac.uk. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. OK. Thank you, Danny. So especially for the person who raised the question, how can we engage with this issue 
as uh, someone living in the UK, living in the diaspora to engage with some Pan-African ideas, especially if you are based in London, you can use this option, this opportunity that this Pan-African Center for Pan-African Studies is creating at the University of SOAS. Uh, please, uh, they, uh, I, I see that uh, the, the website is already shared by Mikhail Woldu, who is a, a postdoctoral researcher at the center. So this is the image that we have co constructed. I don't think that the, the, the second one has enough population within it, but this is what we have. I think we've done good in terms of contribution from the participants. Uh, I thank you everyone again. Uh, thank you, Tim. Thank you for Luki. Thank you, Acheng. And thank you, Yurga. And uh, thank you for our host, Daniel, Abdul, Sunil, and Mikhail. Uh, I wish you all the best and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye. bye. Thanks. Bye.